Welcome to the back to the cross border interviews with Chris Brown. I'm your host, Chris Brown, and I am pleased and honored to welcome our guest onto the show today. He was the ninth speaker of the legislative assembly in Alberta. He also served as MLA for Calgary McMillan and Calgary Egmont from 1979 to his retirement in 1993. I am pleased and honored to welcome former speaker of the legislative assembly, the Reverend David Carter. David, welcome to the show. Thanks very much. So, David, um, do you mind if I call you David during the interview? Is that okay? No, quite. Go right ahead. That's my Christian name. (laughs) Okay, perfect. So I've started off all my interviews with former politicians the exact same way, so you're no exception. So, David, for you, where did your sense of duty to serve come from? Uh, Growing up in the war years, in 19... uh, from 1939, when I was only five years old, so my family and I we lived in Regina, and you you were as a child you were very much aware that there was tension and anxiety on the behalf of everybody as to their loved ones serving overseas. My dad, who's also a clergyman, he was padre to the landlocked. Uh, Navy base in Regina, HMCS Queen. So I was very much aware of him, uh, you know, delivering the sad news of somebody who had died or visiting the wounded or dealing with the families. So it's out of that sense of uh, anxiety and awareness of the world that uh, later on that influenced me greatly to uh, eventually much to my surprise, to become a clergyman. And then after that, much to another dose of surprise, I ended up uh, entering provincial politics on a, because I wanted to serve people in a broader area. And then again, out of all that, I was truly surprised for the third time to be privileged to be named Speaker of the Assembly. So I want to start our story off in 1979, when you uh, announced that you were going to run for provincial politics. You were a clergyman at the time, and then you announced that you were going to run for politics in the riding of Calgary McMillan. uh, McMillan, Millican, sorry, I apologize. Um, What was the decision based on? Because the incumbent MLA at the time uh, was retiring. He was a PC MLA, and he announced that he was not going to be seeking another term, but you decided to put your name for it. What was that decision based on, David? Tom Donnelly was the backup quarterback to the Saskatchewan Rough Riders before he became an MLA. He decided he'd had enough of it. And uh, at that time, I was uh, very much involved in downtown Calgary with housing crisis in the Beltline area of Victoria Park. And prior to that, as university chaplain uh, I was much concerned with trying to find student housing at the university, also uh, Mount Royal College then downtown, and also Southern Alberta, Alberta Institute. It was during that period of time that the land developers in Calgary really ran roughshod over the belt areas, and in particular, Chinatown. So I'd been 10 years at the cathedral in downtown Calgary, during which time I was able to be the main developer and we did a land deal between the Roman Catholic Church next door and the Anglican Cathedral and then we had built a senior citizens high rise right beside the cathedral in St. Francis. So with all this interest in senior citizens housing, I even in spite I was really busy at the national level and writing history, I was getting bored after 10 years in downtown Calgary by Olympic Plaza. So I, in order, I was getting frustrated that the Anglican Church and other denominations weren't doing enough in terms of social outreach. Outreach. So I was there. I heard Tom wasn't going to run again. So that, and then the shortest version, yes, thanks to a lot of good people, I ended up having the nomination and winning first in 19 February 79. 
So you you chose the Progressive Conservative Association of Alberta, which is the PCs, the former Progressive Conservatives in Alberta. Was that your only choice? Because at that time, there was the social credit that was around. There was the Liberals. There were the NDP. But you chose the PCs. What was it about Peter Lougheed and the PCs that spoke to you that you said, OK, that's where I'm going to park my political bandwagon to run for them and not another party? Well, the obvious decision was made on the fact that Peter was a man of great integrity, incredible energy, and the fact that that was when the Progressive Conservative Party truly was Progressive Conservative, not the strange kind of, excuse me, I'll use the word abortion of what it parades under today. So I was fortunate to be there under Premier Lloyd for two years. And then two, I mean, two terms, and then two terms under Don Getty, another fine, fine man. So I was really privileged to be part of the best years, uh, most of the best years of the truly progressive conservative party. So it was a broad umbrella, and uh, I fitted into that umbrella, and I appreciated their determination. And above all, their drive and uh, and the honesty that was involved. What was the biggest eye opening in that first election for yourself? Because as a as a clergyman, you you you're used to speaking in front of large groups. You're used to doing outreach. You're used to <laughs> going to community events and talking to people. But when you run for politics, it's a different beast in itself. So for you. What was the difference in being a clergyman to being that first 1979 David Carter candidate? Well, the amusing thing is that uh, once I got up there and I was welcomed by another, you know, fine group of people who took me under their wing, and they would say, well, what's a nice boy like you doing a place like this? And I said, well, where do you think I learned my politics? It was in the church, but also in the church as to those years where we were dealing that as a small group with uh, business developers and city hall and all that stuff. Out of all that, it's quite interesting. Three times I withdrew my name from trying to be elected a bishop. And uh, then, so the funny thing is that while well, the church really sort of cut me loose, uh, that's another story. But anyway, so my colleagues in, co- in uh, caucus started calling me Bish, short for Bishop. Now, the real difficulty is that, and most people are ignorant of this today, including pol- political science experts at universities and colleges, and also some lawyers, come to think of it, that uh, the whole process of having to buy memberships, get people out, hopefully they'll show up, Hopefully they'll vote for you. You know, beating beating the bushes. Uh, we have Canadians have this illusion that oh yeah, just put your name forward and maybe you'll get elected and maybe you go on to do other things of uh, you know within the jurisdiction of the legislature. Well, it's a real nifty gritty experience. And then once you get there, again, uh, this is part of my continuing concern is that. Um, a lot of people, they go there for power rather than for service. You know, how do they get ahead? And that, that's the wrong way to get at it. But along the way, a lot of excellent people don't run for political parties because the process is too tough um, in, in the trenches. And then once you're there, then there's so incredible pressures upon not only the person who is elected, but again, in terms of their families, and the attrition rate in families and members is a uh, is much is very significant. And that one of those things, even before you get yourself roasted by the media <laughs> and people who, you know, people who don't bother to dig to the real issues and do not for one minute understand parliamentary procedure. Okay, I, that's rattling on, but that's a couple of things which uh, really are, in fact, whether you serve at all. 
And I'm going to come back to that later on in the interview, but I want to stick to that first election in 79. So on March 14th, 1979, you were elected as the MLA for Calgary Millican. Now, um, yep. you have had the pleasure, uh, including a few other thousands of Albertans, to serve in the Legislative Assembly of Alberta. You have had the pleasure of walking on that floor as an elected official. And the decisions you made, the decisions you voted on, impacted the day-to-day lives of people across this great province that take go back to that very first time you walked onto that floor what was the moment was it surreal to walk on that floor as an elected official take me through your process of getting into that building for the first time well number one you're very much aware it's an honor but for me, it also represents a very distinct change in my whole life career. Because previous to all that, in terms of academic background, and the, and uh, as I've mentioned, being a university chaplain and uh, social action, and then within the church, that uh, a lot of and then national committees, international committees from the church. So all of a sudden, there I am. I've changed course. I remember one time years previously that Eddie Schreier at the time was Premier of Manitoba, and I'd known him in the college, and the part of his staff came to me after I was ordained and said, uh, Premier Schreier would like you to come back to Manitoba, which was a Mano- which was an NDP governor. He said he'd like you to be on his chief staff, to which I laughed, and I said, no, I, I'm firmly committed to be a clergyman. So again, to come back to entering the Alberta legislature for the first time, it was wasn't quite night and day difference in my life, but it certainly was significant. And again, you don't get the way you walk on the chamber to, just for the uh, you know for the first day, but you really get seated on either side of the um, floor. And in the days of uh, Lougheed with the sizable majorities. Uh, there were quite a number of us who were sitting on the side of the chamber, which is viewed as being the op- you know amongst the opposition side by side with the opposition benches. No very steep learning curve, and again, when you came to your first speech, uh, you still stand and tremble uh, and tremble, tremble, and wonder if the speaker is going to have you sit down because you're doing something that is irregular. And uh, then in the days of Premier Lahey, the wonderful thing he did, and I still have notes which I've been working at in the last three to three weeks. He sat there and he listened to every one of the speeches of his of his uh, MLAs, and uh, so I had a wonderful note back from him <laughs> with one ex- with a little note where I had referred to uh, the Minister of Culture by his by the wrong constituency name. So you knew he was paying attention. But again, it's a feeling of awe. And of course, when it comes to decisions in the chamber on government members, the real decisions are made back in caucus when you meet outside the chamber before going in, but also at other conference sites. And and again, uh, you know that the real decisions are made by the cabinet of the province and premier, but within that circle, there's another group, there's the priorities committee. So it's certain members of cabinet together with the premier who really basically lay out what the government is intending to do. You, how do I say this? You had had you had the pleasure of serving under Peter Lougheed, one of the most admired premiers, if I probably would say the most admired premier in Alberta's history. Um, what was your relationship like with the man? Well, it was uh, it's uh, it's very uh, interesting indeed because I a man of integrity. A man who has those steely blue eyes, he can look right through you. And he, you know, you, you were quite uh, willing to, to pay attention and and to jump if he said jump. 
And I watched a couple of cabinet ministers have to respond in a hurry when the premier sort of brought, you know, wanted their attention. Um, he certainly got their attention in a hurry. Uh, did he did he listen to because one of the things about politics today and I apologize for interrupting here David but I just want to oh. just get your opinion on this one of the yeah. issues that with politics today is it's the it's the cabinet it's the premier's office it's the it's the inner circle that makes the decision and people on the back bench are just basically there to vote the way that the government wants you to vote and that's it when you served as an MLA, because we won't talk about your time as speaker, because that's a completely different obstacle. But as as a former MLA who was uh, not in cabinet, did you ever find feel like you your voice didn't matter around the caucus table? Like you could have voiced your opinion in a way that people listened. Yeah. Well, the wonderful thing about caucus in those far off days of yore, up at government house, the two circular tables. That when you when we were in you know in in caucus meetings, you were seated alphabetically according to your surname, and so you might if you're all together in the back row, for example, on one side of me was my dear friend Jack Campbell, who I buried earlier this year. So and then on my other side was Tom Chambers, the cabinet man. So then in front in the row in front of you, there was another group. So at the next meeting, they shifted the arrangement of the of this. It shifted so you were never able to build up, for example, a clique. Yeah. There, you had lots of friends, lots of friends. <laughs> That's but it. But it was a it was a way to also to get uh, interpersonal relationships going as as well. Well, you could ask the questions and all that. Uh, in addition, we also had those of us MLAs from Calgary. We had our own caucus meetings from time to time to sort of say, well, what's needed in this part of Calgary or overall? And uh, I remember one, one meeting where it was pre Olympic 88, and, um, and the premier was there, and I, because I represented Chinatown and uh, all the way out to Ogden. And I said, well, you know, it'd be, a, it'd be a good idea if sometime we built a new arena to replace the, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> the arena deal, the arena issue has still not gone away <laughs> for those who don't live in well, Calgary. Well, yeah, no, but the, the best part of this at the time, this is so pre-announcement about the Olympics, that I said, you know, it'd be a good idea to have a, to have a new uh building to replace the corral. Well, the premier looked at me and he said, oh, no, we can't afford, you know, we shouldn't, you know, we can't afford them. Well, then a short while later, when it was the Olympic bid was out, um, he then said, no, we're going to build a new arena. So I knew at that stage, shut up, David. And, and you know, <laughs> and nudged the guy next to me and I said, okay, I got the message. I got the message. It, it's part of another kind of event. Now, uh, Premier Lloyd, you know, I didn't, you didn't dare call him Peter by name, uh, you know, because it was a respect. But along the way, I was fortunate that as a clergyman, I was honored to perform the marriage of two of his daughters. And later on, I was privileged at his request to bury his dear friend, Merv Leach, the former provincial treasurer. And then again, when we get to the business, uh, on to the incident of, I knew when he was going to uh, uh, resign as premier, and it was a time that I was standing with my robes at Little St. Helens Church in Fairview, uh, at the funeral for Grant, my fr another friend, Grant Motley, and I looked uh, about 10 feet away, and there was the premier kneeling, and his, his, his face, he was about 20 inches away from Grant's casket. He happened to glance up at me, and I glanced down. He didn't need to say anything, but I said to my buddy Jack Campbell again, that's when I know he's going to resign, because the price isn't worth it.
1985, uh, Premier Lougheed uh, announces that he's not going to uh, uh, he's going to step down as Premier and Don Getty is elected. Now, I, I try not to do a lot of research before I sit down with uh, guests. I, I do the basic uh, knowledge, but. Did you support? Okay, so you're did, trying to catch me off guard. I, I'm okay, got, go got, for it. Did you did you endorse uh, uh, okay. Don Getty during that leadership race, or did you endorse somebody else? I was. Uh, or were you neutral? Because you were not speaker oh, at that time. Oh no, I wasn't neutral at that time. Once I became speaker, I I uh, left all party affiliation. And I remain uh, neutral to this day so that then I can comment on parliamentary issues. But at that time, no, I was an upper bencher. And that's the term that Mr. Law, he preferred rather than backbenchers, upper benchers. Um, I was approached uh, by another good friend of mine, uh, Martin Kohos, uh, an excellent architect in Calgary. Uh, I was approached on behalf of Ron Gitter that perhaps I might support Ron's uh, attempt for leadership. But as I looked over the over the grouping, I thought that no, uh, that Don Getty was the man. He had stature. He did physically, but he also <laughs> mentally, mentally, and he was you know a real good, solid fella. Actually, to this day, I believe that the province. Uh, uh, all too many people have sold my good friend Don Getty short. So I became associated with his campaign, and we just did a, I was sort of a one in a group, and uh, and that, that so he won. Of course, that was the time when Peter Park Blinken was around in the boat. That made for some interesting interchanges, but I was honored to. Yep, so it was great. So and then, he, then from there we, yep, he become ahead. he becomes uh, premier and leader of the Progressive Conservatives, uh, Premier Getty. That is in night in November of nineteen eighty five. In May of nineteen eighty six, uh, there's an election called. Uh, the PCs cruise to a th- another uh, government with a larger NDP uh, opposition. And this is where the story that I find so fascinating takes a fun turn for me because you are in the upper benches as Premier Lahi would call them. And you are chosen as the speaker of the legislative assembly, becoming the ninth person in Alberta's history to serve in this role. So I... <laughs> How did that come about? Because I, I can imagine for someone who says they didn't, they, they got involved, sort of uh, a pleasure to serve as MLA and then a pleasure to serve as in the cloth, but then also a pleasure to serve as speaker. So for you, did you want this job? Was this something that you always aspired, uh, aspired to be? Or was this something that was sort of thrust upon you like so many other people in a speaker's histories? Are you kidding? Do I look that stupid? <laughs> no. Well, oh, I, well, dear, I you're awesome. You, I, no, I told you I'd be frank. Yep. No, uh, heavens above, uh, you know, even if I uh, go back to the religious side, there was no way that I wanted to be a bishop. I'm not that kind of holy. But again, in this, uh, prior to that election, 86, I... Uh, both uh, under uh, yes, under Premier Lougheed, I was able as an upper bencher to serve on committees of the legislature, such as the Ombudsman, Auditor General, the Electoral Commission. And those are committees of the legislature as a whole. They're not government committees, although even today some of them think they are, but that's another story. So I was very much on the on that committee, on those committees, and it's there where you have representation from other political parties. So it's in that situation where where you're dealing, you're not extremely political there, and that's where Grant Notley and I became friends. We had a great sense of humor, and we had like-minded about these offices, which are there on behalf of all the people of the province. Again, I emphasize, not government offices. So 
I was known for being the vice chairman of those things as we search for a new ombudsman and for new officers for those other committees. And along the way, uh, I remember in those days we met five five days a week, not this present strange arrangement. And late one night in a blizzard as I left and was driving up 109th Street and and I saw this lonely figure trudging up the hill in the blizzard. So I stopped my truck, my vehicle anyway, and I rolled down the window and I yelled across and it was Grant Notley. I said, Grant, come on here, I'll give you a ride home, because he didn't have wheels. So he came up to the vehicle and he said, but David, I, you know, you know, hey, you're a PC and I'm, I'm you know I'm Indy. And I said, he said, I'm not sure I should get in here. And I said, Grant, get off the pot, get in this, get into my my vehicle, and I drove him home. So later that summer, when I'm also working on behalf of Social Care Facilities Review Committee for the province, I'm the chairman, where we went unannounced into a number of facilities for senior citizens and uh, handicapped folks, all that so that summer, I was up in the Peace River country, and Grant and I spent a whole day together. Uh, he was showing me around the historic sites, because I am a historian. And uh, and I could see how he inter- re- reacted with the people. So we had a great, you know, wonderful time. And so we became, we became friends. It didn't have to do with a political label junk. Politics was However, done differently done back then, wasn't it? Because... I, I can't imagine, and I, I'm not trying to throw people under the bus here, that Rachel Notley and Daniel Smith are doing what you and Grant Notley did in that summer, going out to the peace country and just shooting the uh, shooting it out and just having a good conversation. Politics is a lot different from then to now, isn't it? It is. It doesn't rule out the possibility, but I, I guess it does in many ways. No, it's a vastly different time. And uh, uh, but let's make no mistake. We have, there were people in caucus who sort of almost uh, they had they had great disdain for people on the other side. And of course, you saw that after the '86 election, which we'll come back to in a moment, because then the house became quite divided. In the days when you had in majorities, hey, what the heck? There's not going to be too much rancor taking place. But again, in 86, it was a whole different ball of wax because, number one, Jerry Amberongan, the speaker, was de- was defeated, which was a surprise to everybody. And Jerry, in my estimation, he was one of the best, if not the best, Alberta speaker. I learned much under him. He was a very devout fellow, a lawyer, and, uh, you know, with his his ethnic background, and the devout, he went to Mass every single day of his life. A true gentleman. And he was a great mentor that in the Assembly, you could see what the whole process and respect for the Assembly and the whole, you know, it was there. And that, thank goodness, I had two uh, terms in the legislature to sort of observe and on a rare occasion to be admonished by the speaker for some minor thing, standing up too long. That was it. And so Jerry was defeated. So all of a sudden, what are they going to do? Not only they have this sizable oper- you know, opposition members. Well, here's another piece of that story. How did I end up there? Well, it was my background working on social care issues, as I mentioned, to these uh, various facilities throughout the province, and then working on these uh, very important committees of the legislature. I know I keep harping on it, so the legislature. They're not supposed to give an advance copy to whoever the premier is. It's supposed to go to the speaker to release to the whole house. Anyway, another very fine premier of this province was a was uh, Premier Manning. So the 86 election, there's a snowstorm. Okay, fine. Uh, I get out to the airport in Calgary, 
and I'm able to get the last seat on one of these old DC nines. <laughs> so I get out of I get out of the plane, and the, the seat turns out to be right next to Senator Manning, previous Premier Manning. So with fear and trembling, because I had greatest respect for him. You know, again, a lot of people thought he was kind of a doer, old person, but he was well organized, and, and the epitome of honesty and integrity. Okay, so I sit beside him, <laughs> and while we're going along, flying over, I don't know, Penhall or someplace, he says, well, David, uh, what, what does the premier have in store for you? I said, well, probably nothing. I'm just coming up to find out. He said, well, I uh, said, I think you should be the speaker. Well, I fell, I almost fell off my my seat in that old DC-9. I said, you've got to be kidding. And so I said, to him, I said oh, I hope. So anyway, when I got up and did I met him up at government house, and I was sitting there with, well, you know, many members of caucus watching who was going in and out the door, the small office door on the second floor to meet with the premier to see what if they'd be in cabinet or not. <laughs> so I'm called in. Okay, that's fine. And of course, the, the, it's a small room, so there's not too much distance between my knees and Premier Getty's knees. <laughs> and particularly and, the fact that Premier Getty was a big man to begin with, so there was probably really no <laughs> room. You yeah. know, so, you know, and I love football, too, on top of it all, but anyway, he was playing for the wrong team. But that's beside the point. So I'm sitting there, and he says, well, David, uh, we have decided you're going to be the speaker. You know, unfortunately, Jerry Amarongan has been defeated. So uh, we decided you're going to be the speaker. So I gasped. And I thought for a moment, well, thank God it's not social services because most of the rest of my life was social services. All right, so I leaned back and I said, well, thank you, Mr. Premier. Uh, I, I, I accept your nomination. Uh, and so, you know, deep breath. And he said, well, that's good. And, he said, because they said the reason we're asking is because you all that you're respected by all parties in the house because of your work with the legislative officers committees, as I mentioned. So here's the cheeky devil man. So I leaned back and I said, Well, Mr. Premier, was there anything else you considered that I might do? And he said, Oh well. So you really didn't want the of, job, did you? Did you like oh, well, when he I, a, when he well, asked because the speaker is kind of the referee of the legislature and with a new totally. makeup you you're kind of in a yeah. weird position at that time. Well, it was the biggest change in Alberta history. Yeah, to that date. And no, so like I said, I was cheeky. I I know, but you can tell by me even asking the question that I don't think that was speaker was really on my agenda. Anyway. So I accept, you know, he said, no, you, you got the respect of the house. So then he looked at me and said, no, you're it. <laughs> so I thought, okay. Well, my whole training, you know, background in the church and my understanding of canon law, church law, C-A-N-O-N, which nobody else in this province understands anyway, that's fine. And then so I said, okay, well, thank God the people in Hansard who... Um, uh, they kind of quickly read into a cassette the, the standing rules for the Alberta legislature. We knew most of them, but I was so I could then study it. I then uh, picked up the uh, book for Beauchene, which is the rules from the House of Commons, Ottawa, plus a very thick volume, which are the, the procedures and practice of Westminster in, in England. So now I got into my station wagon. I drove all the way down here to the Cypress Hills, which is about a six-hour drive from Edmonton. And in my little hat-go trailer, one-room shack, no telephone, 
uh, I had power and that was it. And I was snowed in for a week uh, to 10 days and I read nothing but parliamentary procedure. And as I sit here in my office, I look out the window and I see that shack, it's still there. It's still in good condition. And that's when I became, you know, that's when I studied to be the speaker. And because in my own family tradition, my dad, the church, and and the military, and the, I guess I've been a Navy chaplain to HMCS Chippewa and Winnipeg Reserve. So I was, if this is discipline, it's duty, and it and it's responsibility. So suck so, it up, buddy. <laughs> so I'm gonna follow up on that because. I, I want to because I don't want to talk about policy now. I want to talk about the role of the speaker because the role of the speaker is the most important role, I would say. And this is just me being this is me saying it, not anyone else. This is Chris Brown saying it. No, I believe no, the, no, the, no, take, no. the role no, of the speaker. That back. Go ahead. Yep, you're right. The role of the speaker is paramount. It is the paramount. It is the most paramount position in the legislative assembly, because you are no, as the speaker, you are no longer part of the government caucus. You are while totally. while elected as a party member, you are now an independent thinker and an independent voice in that caucus in that room who has to dictate. You better. You better be. Exactly. You better be. So how what important, I've seen in spe- how important okay. was it for you and how much a priority was it for you to forego what the PCs wanted with the role of and responsibility of the Speaker of the Legislative Assembly? Because I can imagine I've heard stories from speakers from across this country and from uh, caucus members from across this country who say they were pissed off at the speaker because they they sided with the opposition while they're part of the government caucus. Well, technically, if the opposition is right, you have to side with the person who is right as speaker. So for you, during that time where the makeup of the House, the Legislative Assembly was so different, how important was it for you to be an independent but still have that PC party logo attached to your name even though you're not technically part of the caucus it was uh, a challenge but right away what i've been saying duty responsibility then you darn you know you darn well do it uh that's still as i'm looking back yeah that takes courage for example i think one of uh after you've been dragged after you've been dragged into the chair by the premier and the leader of the opposition, and you have your first question period, I always thought, and the first time I I made uh, Premier Getty sit down for for going on too long in a question or something, then then I did I did a sigh of relief and I said, okay, now I've done that, now I can do the whole thing, <laughs> you know, because you he still my he was my leader technically if ever I went to caucus. So, and I did go to caucus outside the, with the when the legislature was in session. Now, that has been violated, raped time and time again by the speakers across the country and some of the speakers who followed me. During session, you will never be in the, you know, in contact with the premier. I had one occasion only, and it was when there was a trouble with the media ganging up and blocking entrance to the chamber because of the way the Alberta legislature is built, you have these narrow corridors on each side. It's nice to have the grand staircase, but there wasn't enough room for people to congregate. Anyway, so then there's a jurisdiction issue as to the in. Technically, as in London, the Speaker has control of the the Assembly and all its precincts. Well, that varies from province to province in this country. Okay, so there's a a discussion going on between, uh, let's see, uh, the uh, under Steve West. He was with, uh, not Attorney General, but anyway. And uh, so he had a jurisdiction with regard to some of the police. Then there was Ken Kowalski at that time, who was Minister of Public Works. So that meant other portions of the building. 
and technically the the speaker should have had it all, but he didn't. The speaker who had the uh, supervision of the chamber, the galleries, the press gallery within the chamber, plus security levels on the upper floor, and then also access to access to the chamber. So there was a call. There was a request for a meeting with Premier Getty and myself uh, about security of the building. So I said, okay, but we'll meet on neutral neutral ground. So the neutral ground was the speaker's suite. Uh, not every legislature has a, a suite, well, a section which is for the speaker. As in the old days, you could stay overnight because more a great number of the speakers, aside from Jerry Amarongan, you know, winter driving conditions. And as I say, even though I was from Calgary, that you, you know, you could stay overnight. But also that's where the speaker representing the whole assembly would meet with foreign dignitaries. And that's the way it's still supposed to be. Anyway, so I said, fine, let's come on up and we'll all meet in the suite. I mean, wait, the premier and I would meet in the suite. And uh, <laughs> so he came in the door. He says, oh, this is a very interesting place. He said, I've never seen it before. And I said, well, I've never seen it before. I was elected either. Anyway, he said, you know, I won't have, you know, between... Uh, I won't have my cabinet ministers arguing with each other about security, meaning Kowalski and Steve West. And I looked at the premier and I said gently, Mr. Premier, I'm not a member of cabinet. I'm the speaker. End of discussion. So it was out of that, then I looked at, you know, then I continued to look after Oh, the team and flowing and the media trying to block uh, the premier getting into the building because I had, through my sergeant at arm, my, my wonderful Métis sergeant at arm who served in Korea. He was a legend in his own time, and he was Oscar Lacombe. And uh, it was he and I together that helped to arrange to have the Korean War vets statue placed on the grounds of the legislature. But I know that uh, with uh, Oscar as Sergeant at Arms and he, with his staff, a good number of them were ex uh, City of Edmonton Police or RCMP. So, you know, big fellas. So we made sure, sure that the hallways were cleared so the Premier could get into the chamber. And whenever those various people, such as the media, and I'm not bad at the media, I respect their state and yours, that, again, you, any blockage of any member to the chamber is a is a complete disgrace and a complete uh, uh, abhorrent situation. And of course, I had one occasion where I was accused of, because I was being hemmed in like a sardine, and, and uh, there was a CFCN Calgaryman was standing there and I between the wall and the balustrade looking down onto the stairwell and uh, the camera was really like two inches away from my left cheek and I had a very sassy immature CBC reporter from Calgary uh, you know going at me. I just reached down with my left hand because the camera in those days you know this is a long time ago from your day and your media stuff. There was a pole under. All I did was just grasp the pole and turn it sideways. So the camera was now, the lens was now looking way down the hall behind me. Well, within uh, an hour and a half, the story was out in Calgary that I had the speaker, the terrible speaker, throwing this $75,000 camera over the balustrade and it had been smashed to bits. <laughs> I mean, total nonsense. So out of all that, they then decided that they knew they weren't going to block my way. So they decided uh, 
to refer to their legal counsel in, in Calgary. And their legal counsel set them in line right away. They said, excuse me, you're in the wrong. You cannot block the speaker uh, to go in about his business. Hey, who was the lawyer? Turned to be out, ex-premier Lougheed. <laughs> I wanted just to... Shortly after... Oh, go ahead. Uh, okay. Oh, then shortly after that, at the end of the afternoon, I was going out the front door. I had Oscar Lacombe with me, my executive assistant, and I had two burly reporters on either side of me. I think one was Calgary Harris and the other in the journal. And they were really pressed against me. And so I walked through the front door, and there were pillars on either side of the door. So I just happened to take up more space than they did. and. Two of them just sort of, because they weren't paying attention to where they were going, they just happened to bump into these pillars. Gee, that's the way it goes. I, I want to turn... Are you having fun? Oh, go ahead. Are you having fun so far? I <laughs> am. I am. I'm having very much fun. Like, I feel like we need to have a follow-up interview to this because we're almost <laughs> at the hour mark, and I, I promised you 30 to 45 minutes, and we, we, we so, have... I want to I want to turn to one last subject because I want to get this on okay. the record here be, before we have to wrap up here because I do have an interview right after this, and that is okay. in 1993 you you've decided that you are no longer going to you're not going to seek re-election, so your time yep. as speaker of the of the legislative assembly is going to be coming to a close. Your time as an MLA, so you've served at that moment three terms in the legislative assembly. Was that all that you wanted to do, three and you're done, or was there circumstances that you just said, okay, hmm. politics has changed from when I got elected in 1979? Uh, uh, remember, I had four four elections. Four elections, I apologize. I won them all. Yeah, four no, elections. That's okay. I do apologize. Uh, no, 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 no sweat. Uh, and I won them all by uh, sizable majorities in my constituencies. Oh, no. I, I, uh, no one should stay there forever. Uh, Ralph Klein fell into that trap, uh, really, and but not just uh, not just uh, Premier Klein. Plenty of other members decide. You know, they, they're probably the only. Well, yeah, you just you're not you're there to serve, and by the time I had four terms go by. I had other things to do with my life. And the other thing is that the pressure's on home. You know, during that period of time when you do the research, you know that I was attacked in the media. Uh, you know, again, and that's the job. But again, there has to be some kind of balance. There were some pretty nasty editorials written about me. And again, even in my first term as speaker, because I, again, as mentioned, I had the largest opposition in Alberta history to that time. And most of the opposition were rookies, as well as on the government side. So by being speaker, you have to, you know, on behalf of the whole House, every party in the House, every member, try to try to nurture, don't come down too heavy on anybody, you know, because after all, they're there in fear and trembling, just like I was the first time. But, you know, they're coming at a whole new era. The, the most difficult people, I mean, in one sense, members, excuse me, uh, were um, mayors of big cities. So, <laughs> when you have, so when you have Lawrence DeCorer up there thinking he's still God of Edmonton, and, or Ralph Klein thinking he's still God of Calgary, and now we come back to this focus, remember, a mayor is both the combination of the premier and a speaker, which makes no sense. You have to have a referee. Uh, and that's why in the British parliamentary uh, tradition, you have a, a speaker, and as you said earlier, that he's the referee. He's the arbiter. He should be a knowledgeable, hopefully somewhat gentle <laughs> from time to time, but certainly knowledgeable speaker. And because he's there to defend the rights of each member in the assembly, not the government, not the opposition, not at some other party. He's there to defend each individual. 
And of course, as you well know, everybody's entirely different. So that was all part. But again, so I, I remember with uh, Lawrence Picor, God bless his memory, uh, and that of Klein. But on the on the early question period, Laura, um, Mr. Decor got up and said, well, point of order, so which I had to say, okay, we handle the points of order at the end of question period. We will deal with them because during question period, it can't be seen as a mechanism to waste time and, you know, in questions. So I recognized him at the end of the question period, and he stood up and he said, well, Mr. Speaker, I've, d I've decided that I'll have uh, the member for Calgary Buffalo um, argue on on my behalf. Well, that was Sheldon Schumer, who was a very interesting person to, and certainly knowledgeable in legal matters. Okay, so it's, uh, I said, whoa, just a moment, honorable member, in this place, we fight our own battles. Well, that's the way it was. So again, it's it's a challenge. Uh, you know, there's a lot of wonderful people who have served, been served over the years, and to this day, to you know, have they they they've come up through municipal politics, civil, and and they've done wonderful jobs. But once you get there, it's a different world, because now you don't have the mayor, you know, combining two offices. And again, you're supposed to have a speaker, a referee. I often refer to it as being a air traffic controller <laughs> at the same time. And, uh, you know, then you're aware of the issues in the House. But again, you're there to protect the whole integrity of the Assembly, to protect the whole, in protect the whole integrity of democracy. And oftentimes, yes, I was under attack by the media and, you know, by the... Um, a lot of people who, again, they themselves don't understand the process and don't take the time to understand the process. I mean, there's lots of wonderful people, you know, in, the, in all aspects of the media who, who do diligent jobs. But another asked, quick thing about this, I've asked lawyers, how much time did you learn taking uh, parliamentary law? So, well, maybe we had a day and a half. And when I ask, you know, then we have political scientists who, at universities, colleges who think they know everything. I said, what, did you ever try to run a, to get a nomination? Did you ever sit in caucus to observe the dynamics? Did you ever bother to read parliamentary procedure to see what you can or cannot do? So the answer is no. So there's a classic case where I was, I was suing the Calgary Herald for calling me a racist in an editorial. Wow. And when we finally, when we finally got to discovery, uh, the lady editor for the Calgary Herald had the gall sitting across from me in discovery and saying, we don't care what the issue is. We're entitled to do our opinion no matter what it is. So we do not have to go to Hansard to see what the exact words are. We don't have to know what parliamentary process is. We will be back tomorrow for part two of our interview with the former Speaker of the Legislative Assembly, David Carter.